thanks for uh, thanks for showing up here. Um, my name is Simon Halsman. I'm an engineer working on uh, Qt for the past almost 15 years, and um, I'm glad to be here. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Qt object um, model, or more specifically about some features in in that uh, model. I'm going to take a take a little bit of a look inside. I originally scheduled this for for longer, but now it, since it's a half an hour, I'm going to squeeze it and focus it down to mostly two things. Um, but the, the background is very simple. Um, the topic of the conversation is the object model or the message passing um, in Qt, um, how we can pass messages from one object to another. Because if we can, that's good. If we can't, it's going to be a pretty boring application. Um, and as you might remember from yesterday's keynote from Lars, uh, Qt really tries to make programming easy and it tries to make it safe. But easy and safe is, is really, really important. Sometimes we compromise that uh, over, uh, over other things. Um, and so the primary two mechanisms uh, in Qt for passing messages um, is one of them is sending events. This is exactly what you think it is. You just send an event to an object and maybe that object will deal with the event or it won't. Um, that's just a virtual method, basically. Um, and the other mechanism we have is signals and slots, which I'm going to assume now that you have heard of before anyway, because it's been around for a long time. Um, and um, what I would like to talk a little bit about is, is peeking at how, peeking a little bit into how those things work. So how, what happens from emitting a signal to calling a slot? Um, what's involved there? And uh, the second thing I want to look at is then afterwards is, is um, that this actually turns out to be a very powerful mechanism for, for making messages, making objects pass messages to each other, not only um, within one thread, but across threads. So I'm just going to jump straight into code because I like doing that more than slides. I'm, I don't like slides very much. Um, the example at hand is a little calculator um, with two objects. There's a, a main window, that's the graphical interface which you're going to see in a second, and you're going to be blown away by it. Um, and then there is a calculator object, which is sort of the doing the heavy duty lifting. And just to show you how it looks like, this is, this is top notch graphical. I was a former, in my former life, I was a graphical uh, designer, evidently, as you can see. This is the latest material design, top notch. Um, there's an input field, that's where the cursor's blinking, and so we can just enter uh, one plus two, and we get a result number three, okay? So just so you know, it works. <laughs> Um, and um, the basis of the, this is where the message passer comes in. Uh, the basis of this idea is that the GUI is connected to the calculator. Um, there is a connection from a window here. So when I, when I, I look at the screen, what, what I really want is, is look at the blue stuff, what I highlight. That's usually what I'm talking about because I can't reach all that. Um, so there's a connection between the window and the calculator. When this awesome GUI says, okay, the user decided it wants to do a calculation, uh, it sends out a signal. We've requested evaluating a binary expression, calculate something, it's got a string attached to it, it's a function, and then on the calculator, we just wanna call a slot to do the heavy duty lifting, right? And by the way, if, if this is going too quickly or there's something unclear, because reading code is really hard, uh, do not hesitate to interrupt me or ask me quickly something, okay? Um, so the, the window uh, says, please, give, please evaluate something, calculate something, and the calculator then will get that, it will be connected to that. And when the calculator is done doing its heavy lifting, because it's gonna take a really long time to calculate those complex additions, um, it's going to send out a signal, that's the evaluation completed, and we just uh, connect that to the window, uh, which has a slot called display result, which shows the little label there that shows the number. Nothing particularly fancy, um, but this is the, the core idea, right? You have two, two independent, semi-independent uh, objects, and you connect them via signal slot connection. So, um, two things. The, this, oh, this is actually nice in Creator. You can just go to those uh, things, like you have the cursor here, and just press F2, and it figures out, oh, this is the signal that belongs to this and this window, I go right there. Or for the calculator, for example, I can just press F2, this is very neat. I can go here. So this is our evaluate function, is our calculator, uh, which is just a Q object, and it has the uh, dubious Q object macro. Um, and then we declare a slot section with a slot that will do our heavy lifting work. I can't be bothered to 
do this calculation myself, so I'm just going to embed our JavaScript engine. I'm going to ask our JavaScript engine to evaluate uh, this, oops, this expression. Um, but this could be potentially a much longer uh, operation, and then we finally emit the, uh, the result, which is just declared here, right? So we never implemented this thing. This is just a function declaration down here, um, but we're calling it here. So what happens? Oh yeah, and then when on the GUI side, just one more thing. Uh, this is our main window here, and it creates a little bit of uh, two widgets, a line edit, and the and the label, and uh, it puts them in order. And when the line edit is done, um, finishing like when you press enter or so, then there's a signal emitted, and we connect the signal to a little lambda expression. Those are the two lines down here, and that's where we emit our our uh, emit our um, signal that we request the calculator to do its very intensive computation. Uh, so, let's run this and then we just have a look and see what happens uh, or what this called stack is like. So I'm going to run this and set a breakpoint here in our evaluate function. I'm going to set the breakpoint here, this tiny little red thingy. And then we're just going to run F5. And the debugger. And it also, oops, it also stopped there, didn't it? Oh wait, this is <laughs> the breakpoint had said earlier. Never mind that. Okay. Um, so here's our our awesome calculator. I'm going to four plus five, and now I, I'm I'm in this uh, in my evaluate function. So something did ev evidently work, but now let's have a look and see how did Qt connect this from the signal to the slot. So this is our call stack here. This is where we are right now. But I'm going to go straight back to where we emitted the signal inside this lambda. All right, this is where we had the emit, uh, emit call. So emit as a keyword isn't actually anything at all. If I just press F2 here to see what emit really means, you'll find out that emit means nothing. Uh, the purpose of this emit keyword is to make reading the code easier. It's the purpose is that when you read the code and you see this emit statement, you see, okay, semantically, the developer here is trying to raise a signal, is trying to trigger a signal. Um, this is just about making code really easy. But ultimately, it's a function call. And this is a function, function that we never implemented. I never showed you that we implemented it, because we didn't. Um, we declare signals, and Qt will take care of, of implementing them conveniently for us so we can call them. So the next, uh, the next um, stack frame one up from emitting that signal is, in fact, this main window evaluation requested signal. And from the looks of this, this is, I do write ugly code, but I don't write code that ugly. No, this is generated code. Um, this is what our meta object compiler automatically generates for you when you declare a signal. And what it's doing here, oh, this is a little bit on the tiny side. Um, what it's doing here is it, um, we've had, we've got, we have this expression as a string, right? This is our T1 parameter. Um, so the, all we really do is we, this is harder to see than I thought. <laughs> um, uh, so what we really do is we take this parameter, we take the address of it. So we don't copy parameters that you provide to signal. We don't make a copy of that. No, we just take the address of it. So that's practically for free, right? And we stuff that into, a, uh, into an array of void stars. The first parameter here is actually, uh, what is a null pointer here is actually the return value. You can actually give signals return values. It's a bit awkward, but it's possible because some people do awkward things. Um, what matters is that the, signal, the parameters of the signal are stuffed, or the address of the parameters are stuffed into a void star array, so that's a practically free operation. And then we go into the, into the, the belly of the beast. This is already, it sounds like a secret function. Um, this is going into Qt. And what we pass into Qt itself then is, uh, well, the, the, a reference to the sender that emits the signal and the address of what we call a static meta object. That's a data structure that besides this code that we generate, we also generate a, an entirely read-only data structure that describes what signals you declared, what slots you declared, what properties you declared, what are the parameters. Um, this is the full, uh, the full introspection um, game, basically. So that's also useful to compare and see. That, that information basically allows you going back from this array of void stars, no idea what's in it, to, oh, so the first thing, uh, the first element in this void star array, that's actually a Q-string. Okay, that's how I need to deal with it. So that information is there. And then the third parameter is the, 
is an index in which signal this is. So this happens to be the first signal, so it's zero, but if this was the third signal, it would say uh, three here or two. <laughs> um, and finally, uh, finally we pass these parameters. So emitting a signal is firstly a, a method call into generated code, which just takes the address of, of all the parameters, which is practically a free operation, and then it goes into, into uh, Qt itself. And this is then turning into more magic code. Um, that takes a little longer to go through, but the, at the heart of it, um, every signal is slot connection. Um, is an entry in a linked uh, in a linked list is a date in a linked list data structure. Um, so every connection from a signal to a slot is stored as a connection object in a, on the sender side. And calling this activate function will go through all of those connections, and for each of those connections, it will um, try to call the slot that's connected. Because you have one signal connected to many slots if you want to. Here we have only one, but you could have more. Um, so a quick recap. From emitting our signal, we had went one frame into generated code, then two call frames into in the belly of cute beast, as you want so, and then we come out in code that is again on our side, even though we didn't write it, it's code that was um, generated, and this is because this is a, our calculator class, right? Uh, this is called a cute static matter call. We never really declared this function, but somehow it's implemented. It's actually declared by this Q-object macro. So the Q-object macro expands, among other things, to a function declaration that includes um, this Q static meta call. And this static meta call basically allows us, and we're actually in this line in the debugger, uh, this allows us to, um, to call the concrete C++ function that is ours, so the evaluate function, for example. And this is where we, if you look again at the signature of this fellow, um, this is where on the right, on the very end, we have again our, our dubious void star array. Terrible. And um, we have an integer ID that's, that's signifying the, the, the slot we want to call instead of passing a string saying, hey, we want to call evaluate and comparing strings all the time, we use integers. That's a bit quicker. And um, in this static meta call, we can do not only call slots like we do in this case now, but you can also uh, read properties and, and do a, and, and, uh, figure out map from string to name and some of those things. So there are a couple of, there's a fair amount of functionality that we put into this generated function. Um, uh, but what we're really interested here now, and this is where the debugger stopped, is uh, calling our slot. So then, then we're out of the, out of the uh, signal slot mechanism again, we're back in our code. So from emitting the signal, which is just a function call to one, two, three, four frames, and then call frames, and then we're back into our code. And this is all within the same thread, and, and we didn't copy any data on the way. So that QString parameter, we never took a copy of it. We took an address of it, that's for free, we have it anyway, but we never took a, we never took a copy of it. So that's nice. So quickly recapping signals and slots. Um, what we've seen is generated code. This is generated automatically behind the scenes. Um, the build system takes care of detecting that and calling our meta object compiler mock, which generates the stuff and the code and it generates uh, data structures. By parsing your class declarations, what signals did you declare, what slots did you declare, et cetera, what parameters do they take? And uh, all of that is automatically linked into your application. It's a read-only data structure. You could even serialize it and send it across the wire. Um, we also generate stops for signals that we've, we've seen, right? We never implemented the signal, we just call it. Um, and then there's this static meta call function that is used to actually dispatch and call the final, finally call the slot. Emitting the signal again, quick recap, is a regular function call. We call generated, uh, I already just said it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we call, uh, we take the address of all the parameters, we call a magic function, we go through a few stack frames in Qt, but we come quickly out again into our code and finally call the, the, the final slot. And then our heavy calculator does its work. Yes, quick question? Since you're picking addresses, um, does the caller have to maintain the, the lifetime of the object for as long as the, the, the 
signal can maybe take this to refer to that object? Um, so since emitting a signal is a synchronous operation in this example, right, um, there is no lifetime issue, right? Because by the time the signal emission returns, the, the slot has returned as well, right? So the, 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 con the control flow goes from the signal emission to the slots, multiple, all of those. At that time, the caller is still alive, so whatever it has there on the stack or wherever is still alive. And it will, the, the execution will only return to the signal emitter when all the slots are completed. And at that point, nobody, if, you wanna, if you're in a slot and you want to keep a reference set, you have to, you have to uh, take a copy, of course. Or have some other mechanism. Yes? Yes, so this is for direct connection. I'm going, to get, uh, I'm going to get into another cooler mechanism right after this. One last question quickly there. Uh, yes, um, this was just to demonstrate it. So we're using, I'm using the old style uh, because I like it. <laughs> I'm old. But um, it's, it's also a better way to demonstrate that we have this uh, meta call. And it has one advantage in the sense that it... Um, uh, it does less memory allocation. So a if you connect to a slot by this string, we have a memory allocation less, whereas otherwise we allocate the um, s kind of like a std function um, on the on the heap for that. Uh, but that's a bug, really. So. Uh, yeah, so what he was saying that is that when you use the string format of signal slot connections, you don't actually get a compile error if something disappears or something isn't there. You'll only get the error at runtime, right? And this is the big advantage of using using the address of operator. Um, so I, I, you're generally right. I think that's a more modern syntax to use. But for demonstrating how our introspection code works, I think this is a bit more suitable. So I want to show something else, which is actually a little bit neater. I'm just going to stop this here. Um, so the, the second thing I wanted to demonstrate is how Dickens and Slot are really, really useful for multi-threaded programming. And I'm just going to move this calculator and run this calculator that does this super heavy calculation um, in, a sub, in a separate thread. And this takes just a few lines of code, so I'm going to just do that. I'm going to create a Q-thread. I'm going to call it creative as I am. I'm going to call it worker. Um, and threads like to be started at some point. And uh, the, so Q objects are associated with a thread the thread that they are created in. So when you create a Q object, it's associated with a thread that you just that is currently running. But you can um, move objects between threads. You can push them into another thread, and that's what we're doing now. Going to do now. So I'm going to take this calculator. I'm going to move to thread. I'm going to move it into the worker thread, and that by itself doesn't really um, do much. Um, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't change any data structures, but it informs this object itself through an event that, by the way, you've just been moved for a live object that might be interesting. Um, you've been just moved to a different thread, just for your information, um, and it changes the affinity. And the affinity is then used when emitting a signal. When emitting a signal, we're trying to call a slot. Before we call the slot, we're going to check, hey, 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 the receiver, are you in the same thread as I am or not? And if it's not the case, then we have to do something differently. But let me first complete this little example. This is actually all it takes, but I have to also do one more trick to clean this up. Um, when everything shuts down, uh, now I'm going to use your syntax. So when the last window is closed, I'm also going to uh, run a little lambda that will uh, uh, quit the event loop of the worker thread, um, just to shut this down properly. And then I'm going to wait until um, the thread actually finished uh, terminating. So the wait is, oops, uh, not calculator. That was the wrong name. Wrong capture, damn it. Um, there we go. Uh, so this is just quitting the event loop then, and um, wait is like a pthread join, so it waits until the end. So this is just to make sure that everything shuts down properly. But uh, in, a, in a nutshell, I have three lines of code, four, five, six, seven maybe, with seven lines of code, our calculator is now multi-threaded, and I didn't change anything else, especially not with regards to the message, message passing. And to, to show you that this actually works, um, I mean, that it really still does work, so I'm just going to run it. And um, because now it's multi thread, we can add much bigger numbers. I'm going to add 1,000. 
to a four, and we still get the correct result. It took a little longer, I think. Um, but we've, we have a, like, it just took a couple of lines of code to do this multi-thread. And this is the beauty. This is the true beauty of, of signal slot uh, connections in Qt. We didn't change the way those things are connected. We didn't change that at all. It works, it just works, and it's still safe. This is thread safe. Uh, to show you that I'm not talking nonsense, um, we can just go to, again, to our evaluate function in our calculator here, set the breakpoint again, and we run this thing, maybe. Okay, here we are, and then I do 1,000 plus 400. And, um, okay, we'll still be called, nothing different so far, but here this, uh, this little pop-up here shows the, in the debugger integration, shows um, the threads. There's an XCB event reader that's for, because I'm using X11, it's really old, uh, has it separate threads for input events. Calculator thread number one, that's the main thread, it's named after the executable. That's a bit misleading. And the third one is this Q thread that I created. And this is actually the thread we are in. So we are we're running in the other thread. We're now in the, in the worker thread, um, and that's where our slot is called. And if we go back one step in our call frame, we see, yeah, this is still the same, well, this is still the same weird calculator static meta core thing that Qt generated somehow. It's still the same thing. But then the call of this function is a different one now. This is not any more Q meta object activate, um, but this is called a Q meta call event. And if we go one back, oh yeah, and then this is Interesting, by the way, if you look at, again, in calculator evaluate, the this object, if you just remember the last, that's usually significant enough, the last, uh, can you see the mouse cursor on the right-hand side, the last bits of the address, that's FE0D0, and if we go, remember that, FE0D0, we go back in the stack frame to the caller, and we're suddenly in Q object colon colon event, one I highlight down here, and that's the same object. So our calculator object received an event, instead of, being called directly from the signal exit, we've been called by an event. And this is because when emitting a signal and we find out that the receiver is in a different thread than we currently are, then we allocate an acute event subclass. It's called a meta call event. This is this friend here. And this is the only time where we're going to take a copy of the parameters, because we're going to have to, because we pass data to another thread. So this is where we're going to take a copy of all of those parameters. And um, as it turns out, we're very clever, we know how to copy void stars. Um, because of the data structure that we generate, we know what these individual void stars are, and we have callbacks, and we know how to copy each of those properly, um, calling the copy constructor correctly. Um, so this happens behind the scenes, um, and we generate an, an event object, a Qmeta call event. This is where we have copies of all of the parameters, and we also store the information of, hey, this is the slot you're gonna call, and this is the object, and then we're going to take that event, and we're gonna post it to the other thread. We're going to post it to the event loop of the other thread, and posting events to, the, to, uh, to another thread is a perfectly thread-safe operation. You transfer ownership of that event, that happens at the same time, um, uh, but that, that's all it is, and then you post that event to the other thread, and then once that event loop there and the other thread runs, it's going to eventually dispatch this event, and we're going to end up in Q object colon colon event, which happens to be our calculator, right? We've looked at the at the, this uh, this pointer here, and um, from there, by default, Q objects know how to dispatch these Q meta call events, and then they can call our slot. So, to recap. Um, Signals and slots work really nicely across thread boundaries as well. As well, you can control this when you do a, the connect statement. What kind of connection do you want? But by default, we call it automatic, which means we detect the emission time. And if that's the case, we map everything to an event otherwise, and we post an event to another to another to the other thread, and that is a safe uh, a thread safe operation. And then on the target thread, we're going to deliver this event to the receiver and call the slots. And this works over n slots, of course. Yes. Uh, that doesn't matter. So that doesn't matter. The default is auto connection, which means it's determined at emission time. So when you emit the signal, that's when we're going to check, hey, is this really, are you in the same thread or not? And if the answer is no, um, then 
then we then we just decide that. You can also force it. There are different, actually, I can recommend checking the connect documentation, uh, the different ways of how you, what kind of connections you want. So there's blocking queue and the like that allows you to wait until, uh, wait on the on this sender side, uh, sender side that's emitting the signal, that's in a different thread. You can even wait until the other thread has completed. But it's fairly powerful. Uh, so I'm just describing the default behavior, um, but it's determined by default at the emission time. So it basically just works. So you can even move the calculator later back if you want, at runtime, we could add a button there and move it back into the GUI thread by pressing that button, and nothing would change. It would still work. It would detect it automatically. And uh, yeah, we know, and that's the event when we have to copy data, but in Qt, we do ref counting, and we love ref counting and implicit sharing, and then we just make a very, very cheap copy of it. There's a question there. If an argument is non-copyable, uh, you will get an error at uh, emission time. Or So at emission time, that's when we determine, hey, the receiver is in another thread. We're going to have to take a copy of all of those parameters. And then if we then find out, oh, sorry, we can't, then you will get an error message at emission time. Um, no, at runtime. Um, because you don't know at, at compile time whether the receiver is going to be in a different thread or not. There's no way of knowing that. Um, at connect time, if you say you want it to be a queued connection, that's what it's called, when you queue it through events, um, I think that's when we alternatively would check that. So if you explicitly say up front, look, have this kind of connections where, we, where you copy the parameters for sure, uh, then we will check at connect time and you will get the error message when you run connect, not when you emit the signal. There was a, a raised arm in the back? Okay, not raised anymore. <laughs> um, but uh, that's actually it. Um, those are just two things I wanted to show that I think are actually pretty cool because they just work. Uh, they make programming a bit easier, uh, even if it's multi-threaded and in, yeah, even if it's multi-threaded, which is like, oh, difficult. Um, but there is a bit of time for questions. If there's any other questions, please hit me. Yes? Um, so the question was whether the system will avoid creating slots with non-const uh, ref parameters. No, because slots are something that you implement. So you declare the slot, right? You declare the, so our evaluate function here, uh, that's the one we declare, right? So we are responsible for. Yeah, but it would behave differently in case of queued or direct code. Um, this is true, um, which, which is why, I mean, which is why you need to know your data types a little bit. If you use just queued data types, uh, you could just you could just get rid of this. So I can just oops, uh, I could just if I wanted was lazy, I could just you know I didn't know about calls references and all of that. Uh, I could just pass Q string by value, and it's not going to make a difference because it's implicitly shared in ref count. So that's that's why there's <laughs> sorry. Oh, oh, sorry, a non-const reference. So if you had something like yeah. uh, like this, uh, yes, I, th I believe that is something that we do detect. I believe we do. I, be I believe we'll, you, will, you will get, I think you might even get a compile error. Let's just try this out. Otherwise, I think you will get a, oh, this is dangerous. <laughs> I didn't try this out. <laughs> uh, close, close, close. I think you will get an error message. No, you won't, not at least for compiling. Oh, because... In the copying case, that's fine, right? When we copy the values, it's all right. Um, and when we and when we have a direct connection, the emitter passes a const reference, and we it would cast away the constants. I think we might actually end up casting away the constants. Uh, or differently put. Don't declare slots with a non-const reference unless you know what you're doing. Well, this, that, I mean, non-const references are a, you might as well pass a pointer, right? So as soon as you pass raw pointers, you, you're in the same business as passing non-const references, and then you are in C++ territory. There's not much, not that much we can protect you from. But queuing is safe. Because in the queuing case, we'll make a copy. So for queued connection, this is perfectly safe. Yeah, but a non-cost reference are copy of queued or so. So you'll get a non-cost reference to another object. But that's as unsafe as it is if even if you don't have a queued connection, right? Safe for direct call. 
You have a signal that has an, <laughs> let's talk about it uh, afterwards. <laughs> because the session is over, fortunately. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for your attention. <laughs>